Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning is the account of transfiguration as Mark records it, as, as we just read in the Gospel. And before the sermon, I'll just reread verse 2 of Mark 9. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before him. So far, God's word. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who is at the same time both God and man, dear Christian friends, what do you need in life? Now, the older we get, the more mature we get. I think the better we get at differentiating between needs and wants. We all want things that, that we know we're not going to have, but we also all, we all need things too. Some of those needs are personalized. I have needs that you don't have. I have prescriptions at home that are in my name, and I need to take those prescriptions, and you ought not to take those prescriptions unless your doctor tells you you should. And you very well may have your own prescriptions at home. They, 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 they are your needs, but not my needs. Sometimes our personalized needs depend on where we are at any given time. Well, year, uh, four years ago when we moved up north, we, we, we didn't own any snow shovels. Well, we needed to go out and buy some because that's a need that you have up here. But there are some needs that are common to all of us. And we usually categorize those needs in three classifications. We all need food, nourishment for our bodies. We all need clothing, covering for our bodies to protect us from the elements. We all need shelter, some place where we can lay our heads down at night safely, knowing that we and our possessions aren't going to be all taken from us. Everyone needs food and clothing and shelter. Those are the basic human needs. I would submit to you that there is a fourth need that all human beings have. And I'd classify that need as encouragement. Think of it this way, imagine a 10-year-old. Imagine a 10-year-old that for all their life has heard nothing but negativity. All their life they've been told that they're dumb, that they're ugly, that they're worthless, that they're a burden. 10 years, that's all they've heard. Now, what do you think the chances are that that 10-year-old is going to grow up into a healthy, normal, productive adult? There's a need that has gone unfulfilled in that person's life. No encouragement. And just as a person is going to starve if they don't have food, one of the essential needs of life, a person is going to starve inside of themselves if they don't have encouragement. Someone to tell them that they're good, that they're worthwhile, useful. Someone to perhaps steer them in the right direction if they happen to be going off on a wrong path, too, in an encouraging way. It's a very real human need. Now, Jesus, as we said, was true God and true man. Did Jesus have needs? Well, no, not, not according to who he is, was from all eternity, who he is from all eternity. Uh, Paul, writing to the, to the Colossians, says, In Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. The fullness, the completeness. God is complete in and of himself. He needs nothing. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. You know, we want to be careful of that, too, when we talk about doing work for God, doing work in the church, as if God needed something. God doesn't need us. He's full and complete in who he is. But at the same time, the Son of God became a human being. And part of living a human life was to put himself in a situation where he needed the same things that every other human needs. Jesus needed food, clothing, and shelter. Think of Jesus as a baby. Jesus needed the care of his mother, like any baby does. And Jesus needed that fourth need that we talked about. Jesus needed encouragement. 
and he receives it on the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus' transfiguration, the appearance of his glory, is for his benefit and for ours as well. Jesus took Peter, James, and John up on the Mount of Transfiguration. Other nine must have stayed behind. It's not the first time that Jesus took Peter, James, and John, apart from the other disciples, with him. He had taken Peter, James, and John with him into the home of Jairus, the synagogue ruler, when Jairus' daughter had died. And Peter, James, and John saw Jesus raise the 12-year-old girl back to life. It's not the last time he would do this either. He took all 12 disciples with him from the upper room to the Garden of Gethsemane, but then he took Peter, James, and John with him deeper into the Garden of Gethsemane and said, watch with me, pray with me. We consider Peter, James, and John then sort of an inner circle of disciples, especially close to Jesus. There's another way of looking at them, though. Again, let's take a 10-year-old, for instance, who, who goes out to recess and the teacher says, um, no, you stay by me the whole time. You think that 10-year-old's going to talk to all the other kids who are coming back from the playground and say, yeah, you went on the swings and the slides. I got to stand by teacher the whole time. There's a reason why that 10-year-old had to stand by the teacher. Huh? There's a reason why certain kids have to be a little closer to the teacher than the other kids. They need a little more attention. Peter, James, and John fit that description. Peter, the impetuous one. Lord, let me walk out to you on the water. Lord, if all these others fall away, I never will. Well, and then you have him here in our, in our text. Lord, uh, let's put up three shelters. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. The text goes on. Lord, I will never deny you. Yes, he will, Peter. And James and John, the sons of thunder, given their name because of what they wanted to do one time when they were traveling through Samaria. Lord, would you like us to call fire down from heaven? Burn up these people? Like, no, that's, we don't need you to do that. Peter, James, and John, maybe the problem children among the disciples? This was for their benefit, too, that they were going to see Jesus for who he really is. Sometimes I think it's easy for us to think of ourselves as the good people in this world because you know, maybe we're a little more connected to God's word than others. And it should have an influence in our lives. We made the choice to come to church on a snowy Sunday morning. We make the choice at home to open up our Bibles. But perhaps God works that desire inside of me because he knows I'm his problem child. And I need to be a little bit closer to the teacher. I need to see this glory too. Jesus shines forth his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. And there Moses and Elijah come down from heaven and talk with Jesus according to our text. The Gospel of Luke tells us what they were talking about, about his suffering and death, which like we talked, told the kids a few minutes earlier, was going to be a very difficult thing, the hardest thing that anyone in the world has ever done and ever will do. And Jesus, before that, needed the encouragement of Moses and Elijah. Moses, the giver of the Ten Commandments, would be able to tell him, yes, Jesus, all the law is fulfilled in you. And Elijah, speaking for the other Old Testament prophets, could say, yes, everything that we proclaimed about the Messiah, it's you, Jesus, you are the one. And Jesus could see in himself the glory of his divinity shining forth. Our gospel tells us his clothes looked whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. What a wonderful description. Luke talks about the light that radiated, the blinding white light that radiated from him. This is who he truly is. He is God. And then the voice from heaven. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. The Father wanted Jesus to have this voice planted in his human brain so that he could remember it a few weeks later when he would be hanging on a cross crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The 
Father is saying, I love you, Jesus. I'm not going to be able to show you my love then. I'm going to have to leave you. I'm going to have to forsake you. I'm going to have to treat you as the worst sinner, the only sinner who ever lived, because you're going to be carrying the world's sins on your back, and I'll be punishing you for them. But I do love you. And the transfiguration is a time for Jesus to get this encouragement. It's also for his disciples' benefit, too, because the Father doesn't address Jesus. He addresses the disciples. This is my Son whom I love. Listen to him. The disciples are going to go through a very difficult time, too, as they see Jesus betrayed, arrested, sentenced, crucified. They're not going to understand what's going on. But their confusion could have been lifted if they had obeyed the word of the Father here. Listen to what he says. They thought things were spiraling out of control during the Passion. And then Jesus was an innocent victim, fighting against forces far greater than he. But the opposite was true. Jesus was in control of the entire situation. Listen to him, the Father says, especially when Jesus would say, No one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. The disciples were to have this comfort as they went through and experienced the passion for themselves, seeing Jesus suffer and die, that everything that Jesus was doing, he was doing purposefully for their benefit. And what was going to happen at the end? Jesus was going to rise from death. That was part of it, too. Did they grasp it? No. And, of course, Peter said, well, let's just stay up here. Here, let's build three shelters. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Not knowing what he was saying. Not knowing what a terrible thing that would have been if Jesus had stayed up on the mountain and said, yeah, let's just stay here with Moses and Elijah. Let all the Pharisees and teachers of the law and people who have rejected me just stay down there. We'll stay up here. What hope would we have if Jesus had stayed up on the mountain? We needed Jesus to come down. And we need this vision of Jesus as he is in his divinity, as he truly is, and as he has been from all eternity, as the glorious God, the all-powerful God. So in three days, we are going to begin our Lenten walk as well. And we don't want to be tempted to think, oh, poor Jesus. If only I had been there. If only I were there, I, I could have eased his suffering a little bit. I could have chased some of the soldiers away and told them, stop whipping Jesus. That's not right. I could have given Jesus a cup of cold water to drink. As if that were our place. As if we would have been braver than the disciples when the truth is we needed Jesus to go through every bit of suffering that he did. And he did so willingly in control of the situation the whole time. Jesus' transfiguration before the Passion is for our benefit too, but it's not just for our benefit as we enter a certain time of the church year when we have certain services that commemorate the events of Jesus' suffering and death. It's for the lives, the everyday lives that we lead here on earth. Jesus' transfiguration is for our benefit. Because things happen in our lives. Things happen that we don't like in our lives. Things happen in our lives that hurt us emotionally, spiritually, physically. And at such times when we are hurting, we're tempted to look up at God and say, God, you could stop this. Why don't you? We need this vision of the transfiguration to be reminded that God is always in control and at the same time, God has something wonderful waiting for us at the end of our suffering, just as Jesus had something wonderful waiting for him at the end of his suffering. This vision of Jesus, the transfiguration, when he is literally, the word is metamorphosized, that's who Jesus is now. 
and who he will be forever, shining forth the radiance of his glory. But he's not the only one. We need this picture of Jesus as he would become later because it's also a picture of what we're going to become later too. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that our bodies will be transformed, metamorphosized, to be like his glorious body. In 2 Corinthians, our, God, our epistle reading for today reinforces it. We are going to radiate Christ's glory too. Because we're going to be enjoying the perfection of heaven with him. Knowing that and knowing what we're going to become, seeing that in Jesus before his suffering and death, that allows us to bear our burdens here on earth, to get through the difficult times on earth, knowing what's going to come out on the other side, knowing how we're going to come out on the other side, in glory, in perfection, perfection that never ends. And this is God, the Father, fulfilling that fourth human need for Jesus, giving him encouragement and, and something that God would do later for him too when he sent an angel to minister, angels to minister to him in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus willingly had that need. He took on that need for us. And while we have that same need for encouragement, God gives it to us in Jesus, in this picture of the transfiguration. No matter what it is you are going through, you know how you come out the other side. Glorious, radiant, shining with the glory of Jesus. Jesus needed to hear that, and so do we. Amen. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.